in that sense. But you know, these are things that absolutely work cross-platform that are services to fans. This is a product we came out with called the NBA Trade Machine. It sounds a little silly in, on the surface, but I can't tell you how much traffic we get out of it. Basically, this allows fans to go in and propose a trade from one NBA team to another. Um, I want to trade these two players for that, that one player, or these five for that five. Um, it, it, it gets a lot of use, particularly around the NBA trade deadline. But what's interesting about the way the NBA works is I can't just trade two players for one. Um, there's salary cap implications, and there are rules in, as part of the NBA um, collective bargaining agreement that says if you make a deal, the salaries have to match. And if you make a deal, uh, the one team, if they're more than 125% uh, over their own cap, they can't make a trade. If you make a deal with a player who's in a sixth year uh, and is not a free agency, that has to be you know, uh, countered by getting a player who's not in the free agency <laughs> years. There's a lot of rules and complications that go into it. So we took all that data, gave it to an engineer. He sat down and wrote a program that says, when I make any proposed trade, it's going to factor in all that information. And once I propose the trade, I hit the try this trade button, and I'm going to get a response back that says, trade goes through or can't do that trade. Here's why. You need to add $2.2 .2 million in salary from this team, or you need to add another player to account for the, the, this team going 125% over the cap, et cetera. More complicated than it needs to be in terms of my explanation, but the point of it is we get, on average, when, whenever we put this on our NBA page, upwards to two to three million uh, page views a day when we run it. People dive into it. It's sticky content. It's only obviously for a hardcore NBA fan, but when they get into it, they will spend hours proposing trades. And when trades are rumored about, when we write about trades or potential trades, they go in and figure out, we've actually had NBA general managers tell us they use our trade machine before they propose a trade. The league has a tool that's supposed to sort of work this way for the GMs and the capologists in the league so that they can try to understand if they're making a deal that's going to be acceptable in the league. It's complicated, not as powerful as ours. Um, so they will come in, propose a trade on NBA trade machine, and they get another GM on the phone and say, hey, let's talk about it. Again, it's the type of service that is for a niche audience, but that niche audience is actually bigger than you think. And it's about service and convenience. And, and again, taking this not just from the website, but to the mobile space is huge. Um, in the previous session, there was some discussion about Cover It Live and Twitter. I can say, again, though not, a, not here stumping for Cover It Live, it's been a terrific product for us. If you haven't used it, um, it is basically a, again, I'll use my steroids uh, reference. It's sort of chat on steroids. It's a very robust environment where you can have multiple people chatting at the same time around a live event um, in a very, very easy to use uh, format uh, from Cover It Live. We actually did a deal with Cover It Live so that we have an enterprise version of their product um, because we wanted to have more control of it. Um, but if you don't want to go that way, you can use it for free. Um, and, and if you haven't done it, it's an unbelievably easy way to get your reporters, to get your columnists, um, and citizens all involved in a discussion simultaneously over a given topic. Um, you drop the iframe on your page and you're good to go. If you log again log on to ESPN.com right now or open your iPhone and go to our Masters coverage, Jason Sobel, our golf writer, is covering it live from the Masters as we speak. Um, we also spend a lot of time with Twitter. Um, there was some discussion in the earlier panel, I think it was thoughtful about, well, what do we really get, gain from having people tweet? Well, part of it is you gain a reputation of, of, of uh, knowledge and authority for those people in that marketplace. I also happen to believe that you're gaining an audience that may not be coming to you. And it's sort of short-sighted to assume that everybody who wants your information is going to come to your platform. It's just not happening, kids. It's not happening. So we can reach an audience out there in a way that we probably couldn't reach them and may incent them to come back to our site on a day that they may not have done so. But we, what we also do, and I'll show it here and also here, is we will pull all of those tweets back into our site. So if all of our, we sort of simulcast it, so if all of our writers are tweeting about the NBA, we will pull all of those NBA writers' tweets back into our page. Our thought is, you shouldn't have to go to Twitter to find ESPN's coverage of the NBA, right? You can. We'll make it available there, and if that's how you prefer to do it as a follower, you can do it. But if you would like to uh, you know, see it as you come to our, our daily NBA page, we pull that module right in here. What not only does that sort of protect us a little bit, 
But I think it all, it, frankly, it, it creates an advertising opportunity that, uh, at least on a national level, there's a lot of interest in. We do Facebook, we do some international properties, I'll move on. Um, just a few things. I, I'm not a business guy. I think I have a little bit of sense of what we do on that front. Certainly not in sales. But I, I thought it would be at least instructive, because it was instructive for me, um, to talk a little bit about how this can generate some revenue. Um, and, and why the opportunity in mobile is really unique in, in, in certain ways. And if nothing else, it may be a, a seed of thought. You can go back to a publisher or someone on the business side and say, hey, have you thought of this? A um, couple of case studies that I'll talk about here quickly. Um, the, uh, the Nike puppets. This was uh, LeBron James and Kobe Bryant's puppets. Uh, very, very popular commercials, got a lot of uh, time on our air. Um, they, they didn't want to have a, a, a mobile website to drive uh, people to. Nike didn't as part of that. So they wanted to, but they wanted to, to take advantage of the mobile space to get people to engage. And really the biggest asset of this campaign was these funny, humorous little videos with these two puppets. So if you came to our mobile website and clicked on the video, um, you, it launched the video immediately. So you weren't going to a Nike website or a Nike mobile site. You immediately got instant gratification of the video, and they tried to seed it in ways that was interesting video. It, it, it resulted in a 4% click-through rate for video, which I think you know years ago we all thought, well, that's a pretty small number. I think we all now realize it's a very big number, and add click-through rates. It was the highest uh, click-through campaign um, last year. Another one was Toyota. Toyota is a sponsor of Sports Nation across platforms for us. They sponsor the Sports Nation TV show. They sponsor Sports Nation on ESPN.com. And they also wanted to sponsor uh, Sports Nation on the mobile platform. And so we, we embedded their, their, uh, their ads and their links directly into um, our Sports Nation polls, which we you know, transferred to the site. It's a very easy thing to do on the, on the, on the mobile device to actually click through and, and kill some time and, and cast your vote on a few uh, polls. 22% increase in total voting for us. And that also led to a, a, a Sports Nation, I'm sorry, a Toyota ad um, at the back end. And another one is, is Lexus and Score Center, where we decided when we launched Score Center on the iPhone, we wanted a presenting sponsor. We weren't going to launch this application without a presenting sponsor. And so that the, the opportunity is this is a new space, it's a new, um, we know there's zeitgeist out there and buzz in the zeitgeist about the iPhone apps. Let's get a presenting sponsor. And it ended up being Lexus. Uh, for us, and we literally, as you launched into Score Center, the first thing you saw was a fairly intrusive ad um, that was easy to click through, um, but frankly, um, it was great brand awareness for Lexus and allowed them to attach themselves to something that was sort of cool. Um, in this uh, space in the iPhone and the iPad and, and these apps, it was a cool space. We also you know, do a lot of call to action from air, so if you're on Sports Center in a given night and you want to vote for the Burger King, the king of the night, we just give you, it's, we put it right on air at the end of Sports Center. Here's your text message. Go online and cast your vote. Drives billboard. And then as you do it, once you've voted, um, you get a text message back, you know, um, thanking you for your participation. They've been very pleased with that. We also, this was a Ford spot that we did that um, as you clicked on the ad, on the, on the iPhone app, it actually launched into a mosaic of four different videos that you could choose from. This is not a great representation of it. But a way to, to again, not this old, old advertising idea of like if you click on